um, conservation conservation trust, and she's going to have a chat a little bit about what these penguins have been doing and where they go when they're not visiting us. So I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Robin. Well, thank you all for coming. My talk tonight is going to be about the guy on the left, specifically. <laughs> not the other guy, he's just trying to look cool. <laughs> so my name's Robin Long, and I'm a trustee and Tawaki Ranger for the West Coast Penguin Trust. And at this time of year, I also work voluntarily for the Tawaki Project. Um, I grew up south of Haast, 40 k's from the nearest road at a place called Gorge River. And I grew up basically right next to a colony of about 400 breeding pairs of Tawaki. So they were my closest neighbours. Um, I became fascinated with these penguins when I was about 10 and started working with them when I was 14. So it's been about 10 years now. And I decided I needed to find out some more about them. So I did some research. <coughs> the Tawaki or Fjordland Crested Penguin is the third rarest of the penguin species and at that time was equally the least researched. Now the least researched is the erect crested and we'll be working on that next hopefully. It has a population of around two to three thousand breeding pairs, probably. Um, they're endemic to New Zealand and they breed only in very remote and inaccessible parts of <coughs> South Westland, Fjordland, Stewart Island and other offshore islands. They're classified as nationally vulnerable and data from a few small populations monitored by DOC over the years indicates that they're probably in decline. And 80% of their life is spent at sea, where it's very hard to find out what they're doing. So, those are all interesting things, but I and my other colleagues who work with Tawaki had a bunch more questions that we wanted to answer. How many Tawaki are there really? Are they actually declining? What are their land-based threats? And what do they do for the other 80% of their lives when we can't see them? During the 90s, McLean and his many colleagues tried to census the entire population. And they came up with a number of 2,260 breeding <coughs> pairs for the species. Now, because Tawaki are extremely difficult to locate and to count accurately, some of these counts that they did are pretty good. Some are not so great because the people doing the surveys hadn't necessarily surveyed Tawaki before and it takes a long time to learn how. I've spent the past 10 years surveying Tawaki in various places. This map is what I've covered so far. <coughs> so far I've counted over 1,300 nests, which is apparently half of the population, but as you can see I've barely scratched the surface. And I haven't really started on Fjordland at all, so we don't know what's out there. <clears throat> I found that they nest in a huge variation of different habitats. It depends on the area they're in, and even within an area there are many exceptions to their general rules. <coughs> they can be found anywhere from sea level to probably 100 metres above sea level. And this photo on the bottom right is from a nest at 60 meters elevation with a lovely view that they can't see because they're under a log. In South Westlands, they tend to favor dense and penetrable kiki or mature podocarp broadleaf forest, nesting under logs and in the sides of creeks. In Milford Sound, one of my favorite colonies that I've just been working with for the last three weeks, they nest underground. So there's old glacial moraine boulders that forest has grown on top and the Tawaki are breeding in this network of tunnels underneath that. Some of them are a couple of metres below the ground surface, several metres into the side of the hill. Impossible to count accurately, but I really respect them for their effort to be difficult. <laughs> this year I spent the first week of September on Stewart Island with a friend, um, walking and sometimes rock climbing along the cl cliffy coastline there. And this photo on the bottom left is a photo of some of the Tawaki breeding there. What we found was that they nested almost exclusively in sea caves. Of course, they still had to have an exception to their own rule, and there were a couple in the forest at the end of our last day. We covered about 40 caves of coastline, about 131 nests, and that was an area that had never been surveyed before. This is the colony that I grew up with at Gorge River. It, there's about 400 nests along a 
about three kilometres of Bouldery coastline. In 1994, the McLean survey counted 43 nests there. So that was four people over about two days, not really knowing what to look for. I first counted them in 2009 and we found only 190 nests. Now these numbers up here look like that colony has been massively increasing over the last 10 years. But actually that's just that it took me about five years to learn how to find them. And then you can see that the numbers stabilize. <laughs> so the previous two surveys are only a difference of one. I'm pretty sure there are still some that I've missed though. But that shows that my increased experience over time meant that I had a better ability to know what to look for, to judge what distance from the beach they would be at, and to be better at following their trails through the forest to find the nests. Therefore, considerable experience is necessary to acquire the skills to actually find Tawaki in the first place. And based on going to Stewart Island and Milford Sound, you pretty much have to learn it all over again when you go to a new area. In conclusion, the results of my surveying work show that there may be a larger population of Tawaki than indicated by previous research. Um, to determine population trends in an area, I think the same person needs to go back and do the subsequent surveys so that you don't have that observer bias. This year I finished surveying the colony on Herutanafa Point, which we've just heard about which is the northernmost population for this species. I came up with exactly the same number as in 1992. So although data from some areas shows that they're declining, um, based on my surveying stuff, I think that they are probably fairly stable. However, even if there is a large population, and even if they are stable, they're still the third rarest penguin species and definitely in need of protection and further research. From 2014 to 2017, we, the West Coast Penguin Trust, have been carrying out a study to look at the impacts of introduced mammals on Tawaki breeding. So we carried this out at two sites, at Gorge River, where I grew up, and at Jackson Head, just south of Past, over those four years. And at each of those sites, we had 10 motion sensing cameras, each one trained on a nest to see who came and visited the nest. In the third year, sorry, the fourth year, we introduced a third site to look at different predator control methods. So that was 1080 versus trapping versus no control. And this year, we've been doing weekly visits to those three areas again to see if there appears to be any predation with the mast feed this year. We've also carried on the yearly camera monitoring at Gorge River. This year is a video, so every season we've recorded thousands of half minute videos that we watch on fast forward. And this is one of a stoat on the back of a fairly large chick's neck. Unfortunately the camera was malfunctioning, it only recorded three seconds, but I would say that almost definitely that chick was killed. We have quite a lot of videos of stoats visiting the nest, entering the nest and walking between the two adults. And this video here is the only one we've recorded where the penguin actually reacts aggressively to the stoat. In general, they don't seem to perceive them as a threat. Unfortunately, in this case, the stoat has already taken both chicks from the nest. But at least he gets revenge. <laughs> That's my favorite video. Yeah. <laughs> So in conclusion, stoats do predate Tawaki eggs and chicks. The size of this threat is difficult to determine because we only had 10 cameras at each of those sites. And it seems to vary a little bit with location and with year, but it's probably affected by mast events. Based on this study, we tentatively support landscape level predator control for the protection of Tawaki. And in general, Tawaki don't appear to perceive mammals as threats. I've just come back from three weeks working in Milford Sound with the Tawaki project. So the Tawaki project was set up in 2014, and it's a long-term study of the marine ecology, breeding biology, and population dynamics of Tawaki. 
started by Thomas Matten and Ursula Allenberg of Otago University, who are two extremely dedicated penguin researchers. Prior to this project, nothing was known about the 80% of Otawaki's life that is spent at sea, which is ridiculous. So this was originally at three sites, Jackson Head again, Milford Sound and Fenuaho, Hope for Island. And this year has changed to two sites in Milford Sound and we're expanding to Doubtful Sound <coughs> next to the season, hopefully. We carry out this work by attaching small devices to the back of the penguin and then they go out to sea, it records GPS locations of where they go, how deep they dive and accelerometer data of the way that they swim. And then we sit on the beach for 8 to 12 hours a day waiting for them to come home so that we can get some data. Sometimes until 3 in the morning. We've found from this study that the foraging range of these birds depends a lot on where they're breeding. So the west coast ones are feeding 20 to 40 k's offshore, pelagically, and quite differently to the Milford Sound ones. The Milford Sound ones until this season, we're staying almost entirely within the fjord. This year has been a bit different. And then on Fenuaho, they kind of hug the coast and feed in much shallower water. This is really good for them because it means that when we have climatic events like El Nino, they are affected differently in those different areas. So in the 2016 El Nino, the Jackson Head birds did really badly. They were really affected by that and most of their chicks starved. Meanwhile, at the same time in Milford Sound, some of them raised two chicks, which is amazing for a crested penguin. The deepest dive we've recorded so far was in Milford Sound this year, 97 metres. They'll probably make it over 100 soon, we just haven't recorded it. And we're still waiting on some more information on their diet to come back from our poo samples, but it seems to be dominated by about 60% fish, with some squid, krill and jellyfish. <coughs> Although the jellyfish is probably as a result of eating fish larvae that hide under the jellyfish. At the end of the 2017 breeding season, we put 20 devices on Gorge River Tawaki, and these were longer term devices that transmit to a satellite, so you can see in real time where the bird is with 100 metres accuracy or so. This is to see where they go in the two months between the end of the breeding season and returning to land to molt. So when they return to land, they need to have pretty much doubled their body weight so that they can fast for three weeks and completely replace all of their feathers. So it's really important that they go somewhere with an exceptionally good food source. We kind of thought that they would go close to New Zealand because it's not very far to swim. But what we found was that they went up to 7,000 k's round trip all the way down to the sub-Antarctic front. This is the longest distance covered by any penguin so far that's been recorded for this stage of the life cycle. And we really don't know why. This year we tracked the migration between the molt and the next breeding season, which is about four months, and found that again they go to the sub-Antarctic front. Interestingly, the snares penguin that breeds about there, they go west to the subtropical front, while the Tawaki swims straight past them all the way down to the sub-Antarctics. We don't know why they do this. Maybe there's some instinctive need to go back there because they evolved there. Maybe there's the swimmer really long way gene, as suggested by Giselle, who up our paper is this fantastic cartoon. I don't know. The more I work with Tawaki, the more confused I get, and the more questions I have. And that's where I am. That's the rest of my life, answering those. <laughs>